Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm on Bloom Street where it meets Madison Avenue, if you know where that is. And we're going to talk about the place behind me, at least one apartment in the place behind me, Mrs. E. Watson's Tourist Home and the Green Book. If you're not familiar with the Green Book, the Green Book was published between the 1930s and the 1960s and it listed out places that black travelers um, could find accommodation in service. Um, it listed places all over the country, including a number in Maryland and a large number in Baltimore. Um, and maybe we're going to start there. Before we talk about Mrs. Watson's place, let's talk about the Green Book a little bit. Um, the Green Book was in response to the Jim Crow era of heightened segregation and racism. Um, if you were a black traveler, particularly uh, a black traveler by car in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s when the Green Book was about, um, the, world, uh, the world of the road was full of a number of dangers. Um, you may pull into a town um, and see a sign that said, uh, Blacks not welcomed after dark. That was called a sundown town. Um, hungry travelers would be turned away at restaurants. Um, travelers in need of gas would be turned away at gas stations. Um, and there were many an utterance, I am sure, uh, of God help us if you were a black motorist and your car broke down nearing dark in a town somewhere in America. Um, the dangers were both north and south of the Mason and Dixon line. As one commentator put it, and I'll quote, it didn't matter if you were Lena Horn or Duke Ellington or Ralph Bunch traveling state to state if the road was not friendly or obliging. So in 1937, a postman in New York named Victor Green um, decided to do something about it, and he published a list, a uh, 15-page list, of places in the New York area where black travelers, or just black folks in general, um, could be served. He uh, came up with the list from his own experience and um, uh, sort of interviewing his uh, postal union friends. And that was a really good group to uh, interview for this because these folks literally every day walked the streets in New York and knew what was up. So that first list came out in 1937 and covered uh, the greater New York area. 30 years later in 1967, uh, with the last year of its publication, it was 99 pages. Uh, the Green Book uh, was uh, taking after uh, Victor Green's name in every state in the Union, including a few cities abroad. Um, the listings for, were for restaurants and hotels and gas stations, but also for things like beauty shops um, and nightclubs and state parks. The focus was on whether the place would accommodate uh, black travelers, not on the color of the uh, skin of the owner. So the places listed could be owned by uh, black or white or anybody as long as they would accommodate uh, black folks. Um, the Green Book was organized state by state, uh, and then within each state you had a list of the cities or towns. So as a traveler, it was pretty easy to use. Um, in Maryland, over that 30-year run of the Green Book, we had 103 sites listed in 26 towns, so a, a good number here. Baltimore in 1938, that first year of the Green Book going beyond New York, um, we had a long history by then of strong black communities. Uh, before the Civil War, we had more free blacks than enslaved blacks. In the 1930s, we had people like Lily Carroll Jackson organizing thousands of people for civil rights. But we also had a long history of discrimination and racism in Baltimore in, uh, by the 1930s. In 1904, for example, we passed a streetcar ordinance officially segregating public transportation by race. And in 1910, we passed the notorious West Ordinance uh, that by city ordinance segregated Baltimore block by block. Um, and it took until 1963 uh, for the state of Maryland to adopt what was called the Public Accommodations Act uh, that made it uh, illegal to discriminate based on race in public places. As a somewhat aside, uh, a gentleman named Jack Lapidus, a former Baltimore Heritage Board member and past president, um, he was first elected in the state legislature in 1963, running on a platform to support the Public Accommodations Act. So a really neat legacy there. Um, the listings in Baltimore, and there were many, there were places like the Casino Nightclub on Pennsylvania Avenue, owned by Little Willie Adams, a colorful figure. We did a story on him. Check that out. Um, the Esso Gas Station on Fremont Avenue, a place called the Gardens Dining Room on Druid Hill Avenue, and then Mrs. E. Watson's Tourist Home behind me. Um, uh, Mrs. E. Watson, the E was for Etta. She occupied the first floor apartment in the Bellevue Madison apartment building behind me. Um, and she got there in 1946. And in 1947, she started uh, listing in the Green Book um, as a place for black 
folks to stay. She was not the only tourist home listed in Baltimore or even in the state of Maryland. In that same year, there were three tourist homes listed in Frederick alone. So what was a tourist home? That's not a term that we, uh, that we come across much anymore. And in a nutshell, it was basically an Airbnb 75 years before we got that term Airbnb. They were homes or apartments or parts of homes or apartments that people um, would rent out for the night. Uh, if you were the traveler, maybe in the morning you'd get a cup of coffee and light fare, maybe not. Um, and the deal was they were really for people to stay uh, at nighttime. They weren't uh, inns where you would lounge around all day. They were safe havens that after a long day of travel, you had a place that you knew you could come back to. And the reason that we needed them was that hotels were notoriously discriminatory. Places like the Lord Baltimore and the Emerson and the Southern and the Belvedere Hotel all would not rent rooms to black people at all. Um, Etta Watson had a good location. She was right around the corner from Pennsylvania Avenue, um, the, uh, the hub of tourist activity for its entertainment, as well as just around the corner from the black YWCA and YMCA, um, also hubs for tourists. Um, I'm going to wrap up by saying uh, the Green Book ended in 1967, but there's been a resurgence in interest in it, both in the history of the sites that it included, but also in how the Green Book itself played an important role in American history. And we'll put some links. There's a lot being written on it, uh, even as we speak. And we'll put some links if you're interested, at least as starting points, to dive in further. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.